Located above the equator on the southern coast of West Africa, Ghana lies on the Gulf of Guinea in the Atlantic Ocean. In 1957, it was the first country south of the Sahara to gain independence from the European colonial powers. Since the 15th century, the Atlantic shore of this area, dubbed the Gold Coast by the Portuguese, has been a destination for trade between the continents. Elmina Castle, built by the Portuguese 10 years before Columbus discovered the New World, still towers above the city of Elmina, a reminder of the long-standing involvement of Ghanaians in the global economy. Once one leaves the coast, Ghana is a region of savanna grasslands, divided by a broad band of dense tropical rainforest. The climate is characterized by two distinctive seasons, the dry season and the wet season. Ghana is rich in its culture and its people. It is a plural society with a growing population of 19 million, six major ethnic groups and languages, and a culture where indigenous beliefs combine with contemporary politics, economics, and religion. The national economy is based largely on the export of tropical hardwoods and cocoa. Ghana is the third largest supplier of the world's chocolate, exporting 243,000 tons of cocoa a year. Commercial lumbering has led to deforestation, a major environmental problem for Ghana. The tropical forest that used to cover 34% of Ghana has been reduced to one quarter its original size. Secondary growth and savanna have taken its place. While the Ghanaian economy is largely agrarian, on the coast, fishermen daily defy the pounding surf in their small boats to supply fresh fish to the markets. In the rural areas, small villages are the homes to Ghanaian farmers who rely on root and grain crops for their subsistence. Forest products are also important. Firewood is a necessity of life. The nuts from the forest oil palm trees are used to make favored Ghanaian dishes. The Ghanaian people are moving steadily toward peaceful economic growth. A sense of optimism, an entrepreneurial spirit, and a growing sense of membership and participation in the global community is found throughout society. Ghanaians have a major concern with building a future for their children. Elementary schools are part of the landscape. Literacy is a primary goal for the government, and by the mid-1990s, over 75% of Ghana's children were enrolled in primary school. Secondary education is becoming increasingly available throughout the country, while four national universities and a university college of education provide further training for life in Ghana's changing world. Whether living in the urban or the rural areas, Ghanaians are comfortable with a dynamic culture flow in which the old and the new, the indigenous and the contemporary exist side by side and sometimes blend. The handcrafted market basket competes with the plastic container. Computers are increasingly seen in the context of contemporary businesses, while nearby a woman prepares workers' meals over an open fire. The financially successful entrepreneur builds a modern house in his home village near the mud block family home in which he or she grew up. Most visitors enter Ghana through Accra. The coastal city with a population of over one and a half million serves as capital and major business, industrial and shipping center for the country. The vitality of the informal economy is apparent on the major streets of the sprawling city. Street peddlers abound, and roadside small-scale industries display their wares to the passing motorists. Over 300 years ago, the Asantehini, king of the Asante, and his chiefs ruled the southern and central areas of contemporary Ghana from their capital in Kumasi. Over the centuries, the Asante developed one of the world's great art traditions. The distinctive Ghanaian arts of gold working, silk weaving, brass casting, and wood carving, for example, were first developed to serve the needs of the Asantehini 
his court and the chiefs. To this day, one can still see displays of leadership arts in the context of important funerals, festivals, and political events, where Asante indigenous leaders appear wearing the finest of culturally important dress and surrounded by other items of leadership arts. Today, the Asante heartland is artistically rich because the earlier rulers of the Asante kingdom gathered together the most skilled craftspeople from the region and relocated them to craft villages surrounding the capital city of Kamasi. These villages continue to be centers for the production of local and export crafts. Unlike many of the world's indigenous art traditions, Ghana's arts are alive and well. As an example, the distinctive carved stool of the Asante is still commonly seen in houses, shrines, and palaces. As an art object, it has wide appeal, so that today, urban-based carvers in Kamasi work full-time producing elaborately decorated stools for the export trade. The art of dress is also highly developed at all levels of society. Kente cloth of silk, cotton, or rayon, once produced only for the use of royalty, is now purchased and worn by any who can afford it. Another time-sanctioned cloth commonly seen today is adinkra, cotton cloth dyed with local pigments and stamped with meaningful symbols. Craftsmen are kept busy in the village of Intanso, near Kumasi, producing adinkra, which is worn by Ghanaians for funerals and other important rites of passage. Like most Asante arts, each motif applied to adinkra is loaded with meaning. One popular pattern called Except God, meaning there is no one to fear other than God, has been adapted to a number of different crafts by contemporary artisans. Contemporary artisan entrepreneurs who develop products for the global market draw upon the indigenous repertoires that have been produced in Ghana for centuries as they enthusiastically embrace old and new markets in the changing society. Craft products being produced in Ghana today can be divided into three functional types. Crafts, which meet the needs of everyday life. Elaborated crafts, serving prestige and political functions and crafts for tourists and agents of the global market. While the functions of the art products are significantly changed when crafted for the outside market, the indigenous forms are a constant base for inspiration. Simultaneously, the artisan is freed from the demands of traditional use and can freely experiment. To develop products for the global market, artisans are faced with a new clientele halfway around the globe. In entering these new markets, mentoring is vital to success. Aid to Artisans Ghana, known as ATAG, is a non-governmental organization in Accra, Ghana. With a primary goal of strengthening employment opportunities for rural and urban artisans, Bridget Kerimotten explains that ATAG provides mentoring guidance in three primary areas, product design and technical assistance, business training, and marketing in the local, tourism, and global arenas. First, in the area of product design and development, ATAG links artisans with foreign consultants who bring expertise in market-driven product design from the U.S. and Europe. During hands-on workshops in Ghana, consultants who know the demands of the export market offer collaborative technical assistance. Second, to ensure sustainability of the artisan groups, ATAG provides basic training in production planning, costing, pricing, accounting, and quality control. Third, in order that products achieve success in the competitive marketplace, ATAG assists entrepreneurs in attending and promoting their products at international trade shows in North America and Europe. They send us on international fairs sometimes to really have a feel of the market out there, see other products. I saw 
what kind of colors were in demand, what kind of shapes the man could um, redesign and adjust to finish, you know, this help a lot to reshape our uh, products. My first show in the U.S. in 95 really changed my perception and everything. Suddenly I realized I could do better by using just only local materials as against importing this. I was also exposed to this multimedia thing. You do clay and add some bead here or some curry here or some stick here or some wood here. And it's working. I never thought that big a market existed. In Ghana, retail shops in Accra, at Elmina Castle, and Kakum National Park are well stocked with Atag products for the expanding tourism market. In addition, through the Atag trade network, artisans are introduced to foreign wholesale buyers and to export agents. Agents guide the artisans in financing for large orders, packaging for shipment abroad, and understanding export procedures. Atag enters the new millennium with 10 years of mentoring among Ghanaian artisan entrepreneurs who work in diverse media. Many of these businesses have grown rapidly. Some entrepreneurs now serve as role models to other artisans who hold visions of moving into the competitive global market. In the transformation from artisan to business person, successful entrepreneurs face a number of challenges. What have these successful artisans learned that can be useful to other budding entrepreneurs? The artisans identify seven areas on which they focused as their businesses grew. Issues center around raw materials and workshop location, training, design and product development, production planning and quality control, market diversification, finances, and management. Regardless of their craft, artisans call attention to seasonal impacts on their production. For example, potters in the village of Odapanazi long for sunny days, as clay is difficult to dig and process through sieves during the rainy season. Likewise, in Krokrofrum, brass molds require bright sunlight for the several stage drying process. In contrast, the rainy season favors the gathering of grasses, which grow wild in northern Ghana. Bile, whose baskets are woven in Kumasi, regularly travels north to stockpile grasses for use during the dry season. He finds that meeting the demands for large orders is difficult when raw materials are not stockpiled year-round. Not only is production an issue, but storage for large orders can also be problematic. Peter Tamaklu of Ceramica Tamaklu and Happy Kufe of Unique Ceramics must package their pottery for large shipments outdoors. The 75 to 100 boxes then remain unprotected until delivery later in the week. For those artisans involved in wood carving, the long-term environmental sustainability of their raw materials is in jeopardy. As forests are depleted, artisans increasingly design new, smaller products that do not demand the large wood trunks used for such traditional products as the popular Ashanti stools. Wood is also essential for the firing of kilns in the production of pottery and glass beads. With a dwindling firewood supply, Nomoda Jaba of CD Beads cites wood as the most expensive raw material for his 30 artisan bead workshop. For artisans working in beads and brass, recyclable materials are central to their craft traditions. While reclaimed materials help to keep production costs low, disparities in recycled raw materials can lead to product inconsistencies unacceptable to wholesale buyers. For example, artisans in Krofrofrum purchase brass at the scrap metal market in Kumasi. A line of decorative products produced using brass from varied sources can range in color from lighter tinges of pink to golden browns. Methods for establishing product consistency while using recycled materials are critical for attracting buyers who expect product uniformity. 
Artists and entrepreneurs often initiate their businesses in small rented workshops or their homes. Entrepreneurs credit the central workplace for helping to establish quality standards and to build business loyalty. When workers are scattered, as in Bile's Kumasi basket production, achieving consistent quality can be difficult. Bile must travel around from household to household to inspect production for an order of 2,400 baskets, which is due in a single month. Although entrepreneurs often start small, when their businesses expand rapidly, additional work sheds are quickly added in order to accommodate the growing workforce. Soon what was initially a small workshop has grown to encompass a large plot of land. Artisans warn that rented work arrangements are precarious and cite examples of being pushed off the land by an owner at a critical point of production. As they search for land to relocate, availability of electricity and water and convenience of transport are critical. Based on their experiences related to raw materials and workshop location, entrepreneurs recommend that artisans plan to forestall potential seasonal interruptions in production, construct covered work in storage areas, develop strategies for achieving product consistency with recycled materials, and save for purchase of land as quickly as possible. Artisan entrepreneurs unanimously emphasize that having the expertise to train new artisans is key to growing their businesses. Artisans have employed a variety of models for building a workforce. Especially for wood crafts, the small number of master wood carvers has reached crisis proportions. Nanase Opoku Ampomsa of African Version describes the fierce competition among wood exporters as, quote, we're all fighting for the same carvers, unquote. To meet the demand, Nanase conducts regular ongoing apprenticeship training. Nanase maintains that the interest in learning to carve is strong. As evidence, more than 125 young boys showed up for training in response to a small sign that he posted for three days near his workshop. Applying a different training model, Happy Kufe offers mentoring across artisan groups from the skilled potters of unique ceramics to the less experienced potters of Odapanadze. Happy explains, quote, we always said we shouldn't try to grow alone. We want to bring others with us, unquote. As the women of Odapanadze gain skill, their pots provide the basic production ware for Happy's firm. The unfinished pots from Odapanadze on the left are taken to unique ceramics where they are glazed and decorated as on the right. Under this model, a group of potters upgrade their skills while the host firm, in this case unique ceramics, significantly expands production capacity. In yet another approach to training, Rejoice Ajasu of Mama Ray Textiles has capitalized on the large number of students who have completed secondary school but who, due to a backlog in college and university placement, must wait a year to begin their advanced education. Mama Ray Textiles offers a one-year apprenticeship in which young people in their late teens learn the stages of batik fabric artistry, while also assisting in her production. Whether one-to-one -one apprenticeship, cross-group mentoring, or group training, Successful artisan entrepreneurs take training for the next generation of artisans seriously. Large quantities of similar appearing products saturate the Ghanaian market. Willingness to try new designs is essential for artisans who want to build a wholesale client base. Producing only what is familiar, or what the artisan likes, does not attract wholesale buyers nor convert them into repeat customers. For example, CD of CD Beads transferred his bead making skills from traditional opaque varieties to colorful translucent beads in a range of colors, sizes, and shapes. A large order of buttons for a U.S. apparel manufacturer resulted from these changes. Another innovative use of beads includes candle stands that incorporate beads in their manufacture. 
home decoration magazines from abroad serve as a stimulus for product ideas. That's the can read the trend. They can read the trend in terms of colors, in terms of trends. shapes, okay. yes, trends, colors, shapes, sure. and so on. For instance, when you look through, you might see one color which is predominant. Glass through to see colors which are predominant, mm -hmm. shapes which are predominant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, place. So they have to design something which will fit there. Certain craft media present special challenges for product development. Basketry is an example in point. Competition from Asian countries is keen due to low artisan wages. In order to maintain orders, producers such as Bile must develop ways to increase artisan efficiencies in order to reduce production costs. Only by lowering prices will the large wholesale orders which Bile has attracted remain in Ghana. In a culture where copying of other artisans' designs is rampant, Ghanaian artisans have employed various strategies to protect the uniqueness of their products. As a way of preventing other batik artisans from copying her innovative designs before she penetrates the local market, Rejoice Ajasu of Mama Ray Textiles first prints and dyes a large run of 200 to 300 12-yard pieces. Only then does she introduce the new design to the Ghanaian public. In a second protective strategy, Rejoice Ajasu discontinued having the wood blocks used for batik printing carved outside the workshop. Outside carvers often quickly sold her new designs to other batik printers. To reduce pirating of her designs, Rejoice developed an innovative technique whereby her designs are cut in-house using large foam blocks. Not only are her designs protected, but the foam blocks are also highly effective for even transfer of wax to the cotton fabric. From innovative product development to external markets, to strategies for design protection. Ghanaian artisans actively contribute to their dynamic craft traditions. In the process, they advocate for balancing Ghanaian cultural uniqueness while also learning to make what the client wants. Technological ingenuity characterizes Ghanaian artisans throughout the production process. Establishing product conformity across a line of ceramics or throughout hundreds of meters of fabric is essential for meeting wholesale clients' expectations that one product will be exactly the same as the next within a large-scale order. To overcome previous inconsistencies, Otapanadze potters now weigh the clay for each pot as a way of ensuring uniformity in pot size. Nanase of African version, with his strong interest in production innovations, continually searches for ways to eliminate what he calls avoidable sweat for his 125 carvers. To illustrate, using an electric saw, he pre-cuts wood blocks to the sizes that carvers need to complete their work. Carvers can then focus their attention on carving rather than preparing the wood for production. Technological innovations also contribute to efficiencies in brass craftsmanship. Artisans now use surgical syringes for extruding the hundreds of meters of wax tubing needed to create the channels through which the molten metal flows during the casting process. Formerly, tubing was hand rolled across the artisan's legs. Also in the past, artisans hand pumped bellows to fuel the fire, critical to the last stage of the brass casting process. Today, connection of a fan from an automobile air conditioner motor significantly reduces the human power input to production. Establishing a formula for determining production capacity is critical for setting and meeting production targets and delivery dates. For potters, that can include estimating the skills and production potential of workers, calculating drying time, and figuring the number and capacity of kilns. When an order expands from the usual 9,000 pots in a single month, to an order of 29,300 pots in two months, a firm may not be ready for the dramatic growth.
And the first order was uh, 12,000, which we did without any problem. So they thought we had the capacity. The communication didn't go through very well, actually. We wanted to test our strength, and so we didn't complain. We tested it, stretched it to the full elastic point, and <laughs> we couldn't. So we couldn't deliver all. The lure of marketing products on the internet, although appealing to many artists and entrepreneurs, can come too soon related to production capacity. We would have gotten onto the internet earlier, but then somebody said, uh, you better do your homework well, because you could be actually swamped. You could get so many orders, you'd be confused. So develop it better, let's develop a few products, let's know what exactly we are doing before we get onto the internet. Now that we should be ready. And so we are bidding our time, we are trying to get into designs that we can produce relatively easy and fast. And once we can do that, whether increasing production consistency, adapting equipment, or improving production capacity, all are critical to delivering an order on time. As Bridget Kerry Martin, executive director of ATOG, summarizes, quote, if an artisan disappoints a buyer once, the buyer won't come back, unquote. Craft consultants have long encouraged artisans to diversify their markets among local, tourism, and export clients. Diversification helps maintain steady production and a balanced cash flow. Peter Tomaclu applies this recommendation by supplementing his export production with a business in roof tile manufacture for the local Ghanaian market. Now we have switched on to exports full time, and so we don't earn money regularly anymore. And we realize it's not the best thing. So we want to develop the tile seriously and be any money from there. We know there's a big demand for roof tile, so we want to do that. And then let that, you know, as it were, supplement what we, we do here. Likewise, when Rejoice Ajasu of Mama Ray Textiles found the export market hard to tap due to difficulties in acquiring consistent dyes in quantities necessary for large export orders, she turned to the corporate market in Ghana. An order of batik drapery fabric for 45 local bank offices gives her batik textiles widespread exposure throughout Ghana. Outside Ghana, market diversification is also important. As artisans expand their export marketing from the U.S. to European nations, they learn about subtle differences in consumer preferences across cultures. Um, okay, with well, the European markets, they believe in utility items like a bath and you be able to put water inside for flowers or you must do a planter. They don't really believe in um, decorative pieces. They want pure utility products. So we have to design our pieces to suit their market. So what does well in the US doesn't necessarily will do well in, in Europe. The the European market likes things in the natural state. Like colours close to nature. And the uh, uh, in the American market, it's a mix. They like natural colors, bright colors. It's, 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 with bright colors, it sells better in the U.S. than in Europe. Financial issues surface at many points during production. Beginning with procurement of raw materials, artisans cite the continuous need for cash in order to stockpile raw materials in anticipation of impending large orders. In between orders for basketry, Bile needs funds for keeping 40 artisans from the north employed in Kamasi, preparing grass and reeds for weaving. Otherwise, the basket weavers will scatter to their home villages and not be available when a large order arrives. Additionally, wood carving entrepreneurs find that the carvers they employ expect to be paid as they finish carving, not when the order is complete and payment received from abroad. Payment expectations come at a time when cash flow may be low. CD of CD Beads continually searches for a wide range of recyclable glass in blue, amber, violet, and turquoise in order to build up reserves for meeting his clients' varied color preferences. 
In addition to raw materials, artisans often need financial resources to absorb the cost of producing sample products for a potential client. Rejoice Ajasu notes that she often produces up to 20 multiple meter batik samples for corporate clients to choose from as they make their final decisions. Lack of funds can also contribute to difficulty in building up a reserve of finished items for clients who drop in unexpectedly. Retaining sufficient cash for building stock ahead is a never-ending struggle. Many of the artisan enterprises mentored by ATOG started as one-person organizations with a single manager and a few employees. As organizations became more complex, developing skills for conflict resolution has proven useful. Manage good, it's, it's not, not that easy. easy. That's right, that's where <laughs> it's I was going easy, with that. Yeah. As the businesses grew rapidly, the need for reorganization